What's going on everyone? Happy 4th of July. My name is Sean Patterson and I'm a community group leader here at The Rock um, as well as a member of the teaching team. And I am excited to be with you today streaming from home. Now, I sincerely hope you're having a great Independence Day so far. I know for us, uh, having a big family, you know, not having to rush to get everyone ready, but just being able to relax into a Sunday is a blessing all on its own. And so as you ease into uh, this busy day, maybe you're, you know, out preparing to put some meat on the grill or uh, you're laying with the kids swimsuits out or you're on the couch in your pajamas with coffee in hand on a day where we celebrate the birth of our great nation. I thought it'd be fitting um, to talk about the birth of the church. Amen. So let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this day. Uh, and Lord, I, I'm afraid that uh, many Christian communities are at best ingrown and invisible and at worst unattractive. Lord, by your grace and by your strength, Lord, please enable us to resemble the type of community that you died to create. Lord, please, by your spirit, even as we gather together today virtually, do something in us individually and collectively. Help us to, as Paul said, uh, to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're a Christian, if you've given your life to Jesus, uh, you have all at the same time been delivered, you're being delivered, and you're going to be delivered. And in the been and the going, in between that is the being, right? We are all human beings in the messy middle for now. And uh, God has chosen to manage the mess through community. Right? It's through making us a family that is closer than blood relatives. How does he do that? We're blood bought. And so as we look at the birth of the church in the book of Acts, we see something so powerful that not even pandemic nor persecution nor politics can thwart it. All right? So by the power of the Holy Spirit, the church expands from this group of uh, believers small enough to fit into homes to a fellowship that said in Acts 17 that turned the world upside down. Okay, So this is our heritage. This is who we are. Right now, to understand the mechanics of Christian community, you must first understand the book of Acts, right? And so the book of Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament. Uh, it follows the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And in the Gospels, Jesus lived, he died, he rose, he ascended into heaven. And the book of Acts tells us what happened next, right? Acts tells us how the Holy Spirit came upon the church and how the gospel spreads from Jerusalem to Rome. Right? And so in Acts 1.8, uh, Jesus tells the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Right? The rest of the book shows us that Jesus was true to his word because the Holy Spirit came to the disciples and empowered them to work miracles and to preach the good news all throughout the world. All right? Acts 2 shows us how that all began. All right? So here's the challenge that I want to pose to you today challenge is that the way that Christianity invaded Rome is exactly the ways that it should uh, invade and change us. In other words, you can have a faith that's just good enough to give you life and enable you to roam, uh, or through countercultural community, you can have a faith that is power enough to conquer Rome, R-O-M-E. And so in Acts chapter 2, the disciples gathered together in one place on the day of Pentecost, and Pentecost is the Greek word for uh, Shavuot. Uh, which in English is known as the Feast of Weeks. All right? It is the anniversary of the giving of the Torah, seven weeks, 49 days after the Israelites were delivered from Egypt, as described in the book of Exodus. And Moses came down from Mount Sinai. He gives the Israelites the Torah, and they become a nation committed to serving God. And so Shavuot, or, or Pentecost, is the pilgrimage feast. It's one of three uh, in, in a Jewish calendar, and they're commanded as Jews to come and make a trip to the temple for ritual worship services, which is why so many people from so many nations were present in Acts chapter two. And as Jesus said it would happen in the upper room, the Holy Spirit filled the disciples and they began preaching or excuse me, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them and they began to spill out of the room. And so people present from all over the world were shocked as they saw that these Galileans were speaking their languages. And so Peter then steps forward and he preaches a message that births the church, right? And when his message is over, the Bible says that the listeners were cut to the heart. And about 3,000 people received Jesus that day. I mean, 3,000 people received Jesus. Acts 2.42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking the bread and, and to prayer. Everyone was filled in awe at, with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. 
All the believers were together and had everything in common. All right. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. So that's Acts 2, 42. Now, the birth of the Christian church um, is not just this day that we observe on the calendar, but it, it was and still is marked by the movement of countercultural community. And so I want to show you from this passage what that looks like, because I believe that the early Christians in Rome give present day American Christians a blueprint on how to live in and love on the nation and world in which they live. All right. And so they were devoted to one another and their values were reversed. Okay. So first they were devoted to one another. Now the word devote means to give something away. And so these Christians gave themselves away to God and away to one another, right? There was this radical unselfishness about them. And we're told uh, that they met together in temple courts and, uh, and in their homes. And so the question is, where do they meet together? They met everywhere, right? Uh, when do they meet together? Um, it says every day continuously. It was intentional. It was constant. It was relentless. These people could not get enough of each other. They were always coming together. Regular life was seen as an interruption. They couldn't be kept apart, right? And so together is not so much something they did. It was something they were, right? They were devoted to fellowship. The question is, does that describe your Christian experience, right? Uh, Lucian Samosata uh, was a, a Greek philosopher and opponent of Christianity. He observed the Christians um, of his day, and this is what he wrote about them. He said, their founder, speaking of Christ, taught them that they should be like brothers to one another, and therefore they despised their own privacy and viewed their possessions as common property. Okay, they viewed their possessions as common property. Guys, I can't even get my own daughters to despise pri privacy and view possessions as common property. All right, so, so what gives, right? You know, many of us uh, say no to Christian community because we cannot fathom having to live among church people every day, right? I, I would submit to you that this has more to do with culture than you think, right? Culture is this, it's a sneaky thing. Uh, sociologists would tell you that the culture you live in creates these norms that whether right or wrong, they are so pervasive, we believe them to be true, right? And so we live in an individualistic Western culture, right? To thine own self be true is the mantra. And so we champion the needs of the individual over the needs of the group as a whole. And so observing a culture where people despise their own privacy and view their possessions as common property literally gives us anxiety attacks, right? And so our culture has, has taught us to be this way, right? How else do you think that we went from, you know, being New Testament believers uh, who gathered together every day continuously to a once a week gathering as a big group into a commercial building where we sing a few songs, we listen to the word, and then we leave and we wait a week to do it all over again. Right? You don't think that was your idea, do you? And so if Christianity got off the ground by radical unselfishness and relentless devotion to one another, the question is, why is it so hard to do in our culture? And there's probably many reasons for that. I'll speak from my own experience, you know, and from my own life. Amy and I, you know, we have seen Christ Christian community fail miserably in our lives when we just try to fit it in. And what we learn is that a lifestyle that seeks to add Jesus to our current MO is not one that proclaims his supremacy, it proclaims his conveniency, right? Community is foundation, it's not a fixture. It can't just be one more activity among many. And I believe it was C.S. Lewis who said it this way, that if you aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in, but if you aim at earth, you get neither, right? And so these, these early Christians were devoted to one another, and it was this spirit-enabled bond and generosity that caused Christianity to explode throughout the Roman Empire. So I just wonder what it would do in America today. You know? So second, their values were reversed, right? Now, not only did these early Christians despise their own privacy and view their possessions as common property, but as you study the book of Acts in Christian history, uh, what you will see is that the way Christianity spread from Jerusalem to Judea uh, to Samaria and all throughout Rome was actually through persecution and the way these Christians responded to persecution. 
And so Jesus gives us the prescription in the Sermon on the Mount, because in Luke chapter six, Jesus goes up on this mountain, he spends the night praying, uh, he chooses 12 apostles, and he comes down off the mountain and he gives them the word of God. Now, why does that matter, you ask, right? When was the last time that happened? It happened in the book of Exodus on Mount Sinai. God called together the 12 tribes of Israel, sent Moses down off the mountain with his word. Uh, and it wasn't enough for, uh, for God to just deliver them from Egypt. He wanted to make them a people, a new human community, right? Again, this is the event that Pentecost commemorates, right? And so in the same way that Moses came down from Mount Sinai to give the Israelites the commandments, Jesus in the, in the book of Luke descends from a mountain to reach you the, the commandments. Listen to what he says. He says this, he says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how you, their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are wed, well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Again, Luke uh, 6, 20 to 26. And so, listen, Jesus makes it clear that there are two sets of values that oppose each other in this world. All right, one set he passes judgment on, the other he exalts. All right, and so looking at the woes first, all right, there are four values that he mentions. He mentions being rich, full, laughing, right? Now, what's that, right? Uh, power, comfort, right? That looks like people having fun, but the word laugh could be better translated gloat, okay? And so Jesus is talking about people having fun, right? Not uh, about not ha having fun, but people having won, excuse me. All right, and so these are people who have competed and succeeded, right? Gloating is, and if you have kids, you know this, you see this every day, gloating is, I won, you didn't. And so the third value is success, and the last is recognition. So the first set of values, power, comfort, success, and recognition. The second set of values in verses 20 to 22 of Luke chapter 6 are the exact opposite, right? They are parallel but opposite. They are poor, hungry, weeping, and exclusion, right? And so what Jesus is saying is that when you leave uh, the kingdom of this world and you enter into my kingdom, the things that the world values are not valuable to me and the things that the world despises are valuable to me, right? I don't value power, comfort, success, or recognition. I value weakness, sacrifice, grief, and rejection, right? So who wants to join? All right, and so as I, I was trying to make sense of this as far as what does this mean to us, how uh, Jesus values the things uh, that the world despises and despises the things that the world values, um, a commentator on the book of Luke bailed me out. And this is what he says. Michael Wilcock writes this. He says, in the life of God's people, it will be seen, first of all, a remarkable reversal of values, that the people of God will prize what the world calls pitiable and suspect what the world thinks desirable. And so what he's saying is that Jesus is not calling us to seek the values he calls a uh, bus, but prize them. And he's not telling us to refuse the values he despises, but to suspect them. And so we don't go seeking weakness and weeping, but we prize what we have. And we don't refuse power and success, but we suspect it, all right? And so when you enter into a relationship with Jesus, he creates in your inner being this radical freedom so that uh, power and comfort and success and recognition have no control over you. And once you get that radical freedom psychologically, it also changes all of your social relationships, right? You are free from the control of power and comfort and success and recognition. And, and once you get that radical inner freedom, it creates a new community with all other people who have that same freedom. See, uh, in, in the kingdoms of this world, laughing and blessedness goes together, but never weeping and blessedness. But in Jesus's kingdom, he gives us a blessedness that is unfazed by circumstances. And in many ways, it's actually increased by weeping, right? This is how the persecuted Christians revolutionize Rome. There is a blessing in the believer that gets stronger when we weep. It gets stronger when we hunger. It gets stronger when we're weak, right? There, there's a sweetness to our relationship with God that actually that we actually never get to tap into until we lose the world's recognition. 
And so when Wilcox says that we prize the things that everyone else in the world absolutely avoids at all costs, it doesn't mean that we want them or we seek them, but when they come, we don't care. And when they come, we prize the fact that they actually make us wiser and stronger and more blessed. Right? Uh, John and Sarah Williams uh, recently shared their relationship testimony with our fam group uh, on Tuesday nights. And I was so impacted by a story they told. They talked about how they struggled for a few years, for a, a, a little bit, um, as they were just leading their uh, family through changing vocations. And John talked about how he was stressed out and he was discouraged and there was a lot of dryness, but it produced this sweetness of, of his relationship with God. And he says that he's, he experienced a faithfulness in a way that he could not have, the faithfulness of God. He, he actually experienced it through weakness and sacrifice and grief. And he said this to us. He said, after making it through that year, I don't necessarily have to have faith for God's provision now. I know God has provision, right? And so in Jesus's kingdom, through the reversal of values, right, weeping and blessedness goes together. And so Christian community is countercultural. It requires deep devotion to one another and a reversal of values. But now where do we get this power? Uh, like, like how did the early Christians do it? You see it at the end of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, because it says that they were cut to the heart, right? Jesus paid the cost to create this countercultural community with his own life. And, 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 and all of our cultural commitments and all of our assumptions, we get past all that all of our existing values, and he displaces them, right? Jesus despised his own privacy, right? Do you know what privacy is? It's a freedom. And on the day where we celebrate freedom, I think it's important to know this, that privacy is a freedom from being observed and disturbed by other people. Jesus shrugged off all desire to be unconcerned with our plight and made our plight his concern. Jesus viewed his possessions as common property. He willingly went to the cross and died knowing that it was the only way that we could possess eternal life. See, the greatest declaration of independence did not happen in America on July 4th, 1776. No, it happened thousands of years prior on the cross of Calvary. Because there, it was not about pronouncing ourselves independent, sovereign states, right? No longer under British rule. But it was a pronouncement by the shed blood of the sovereign king of kings that if we believe in him and receive him, we are no longer under the rule of sin. Now that's a reason to have a cookout. That's a reason to set off fireworks. Because unless and until you are free in here, it doesn't matter what your external reality is. See, the cross is countercultural. It represents God's devotion to us and a reversal of values. Jesus gave himself away for us, right? Although he was rich, he became poor and weak for us. Jesus forfeited the comfort of heaven to sacrifice himself for us. He exchanged his glory for our grief. He gave up his reputation and recognition as king of heaven to experience rejection for us. Jesus was crushed. He was broken. He was destroyed in order to purchase our independence. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for the cross. Lord, I thank you for all you do for us. I thank you for this life that we have, for the freedom that we now have in you. Lord, I thank you on a day like today, again, Independence Day, what, what a beautiful, great day in our nation. But I thank you all the more, God, that you provided something um, that will outlast this life, something that, that Independence Day, July 4th, is only a shadow, a foretaste of, Lord God. We have something coming to us in heaven because of what you did on the cross, Lord God, that is so much greater. And I just thank you for uh, not only what you did to set us free, but Lord, also for the community that it creates, Lord. Help us to be brothers and sisters who love each other well, Lord God, who impact this world in the same way that early Christians did Rome. We just thank you, Lord, for all you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.